Crouch. Bind. Set. Joe presents the House of Rugby, Season 3. Hi everyone, thanks very much for your company. Thanks for joining us again. I hope that lockdown 3.0 hasn't been too bad for you. If indeed you are in it, at least last weekend we had some rugby to watch. A bit of a different story this weekend, but we'll touch upon that in just a few minutes. Some of you also might be homeschooling, in which case I'm going to introduce my guests as if they were two school pupils. There would be one who would probably be a little bit more well-behaved, a little bit more studious. There'd be another who probably wouldn't have done their homework, might have drawn all over the walls. John Fox Davis and Alex Good. I will let you pick which one is which. Oh, I don't know. I I always had a naughty brother, so I always looked the, the better one, <laughs> the, the better brothers in school. So it was easy to be uh, the angel, I think. Good, are you teachers pick? Yeah. yeah, far from it. Um, unfortunately, my mum was a teacher at, at most of the schools I was at, so uh, it was uh, it was pretty difficult not to get information back to her that I'd been in trouble or I was in detention or yeah, I couldn't really get away with anything. So uh, tough tough time at school. I have a feeling uh, that Jonathan and myself will be living vicariously through your stories. Uh, Jonathan, though, first to mention on the haircut, that's been your your lockdown big moment. Yeah, lockdown moment so far. Highlight of the year. I just, uh, <laughs> just not not head gone, but um, it's a lot easier. And um, not that we're going to be doing anything socially. So uh, ho- hopefully, there's no reflection from the light off my head. So. <laughs> On haircuts, I actually had a haircut a couple of weeks ago. We can't tell, but it was the best experience of my life over here as a, ha- as a hairdresser's. You know, they sort of get you in. They, um, you know, have the scented candles everywhere. Uh, they give you like a, a massage and they, they wash your hair, give you a haircut and wash your hair again and then like a neck massage and head massage to finish. And it was, uh, yeah, it was a very nice experience. Are you sure this was a like hairdresser? Yeah. Well, I know, it's like an electric chair as well. It just goes like, lifts you flat down, so you just like lying there, get your hair washed and lifts you back up again. I'm thinking, this isn't a barber's, this is phenomenal. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I might have to go did, back Did you have the week. Japanese ready to go? Was the language yeah. there or...? No, luckily I chose one which uh, had a uh, English speaking or translator in the hairdressers, so they're pretty prepared for myself, I think. But, yeah. yeah. How is training, fun. and um, when do when do you actually start? Does it is it this weekend? It all starts properly. Yeah, so we've got a game against uh, Panasonic, which is George Cruz's team oh, yeah. on Sunday, which is the first game of the season. Um, he he's currently pr- not talking to me after for ten days because I mean. Foxy, pretty known from the Lions, he, he takes a bit of stick from uh, English boys and uh, especially yeah. Sarri's boys. And um, I managed to get hold of a clip of him playing last week where he gets completely bumped and then the guy keeps running and George gets up and then chased him down like furiously. He's running back as fast as he's ever run. And I thought it was like pretty hilarious and, and said it to Mako. Um, and Mako <laughs> being the biggest stitch up. Yeah, I just thought he'd have a laugh. Within two seconds, he'd put it on the Sari's WhatsApp group and just just put because good to see nothing's changed, <laughs> and everyone starts laying into him and playing. I'm like, oh, Matt, what have you done? I wouldn't have cared because there's, there's me commentating on the video, like giggling. Um, apart from the fact that I'm playing in this week, and you know, he's he's already sort of made a few comments about how he's just gonna come after me and send every every player into me and just like try and like basically leave a few shoulders and elbows at me so um pretty sure if there's any clips of me shanking kicks or missing tackles they'll be straight up on the whatsapp group too so you've got that bullseye in your chest then have you yeah pretty much he's he's i think his, his game plan is he's told the coach just to just to run down 10 cha- down my channel um just take me out all the time uh, probably say that my head will, head will go or something like that. So, yeah, it could be. He'd be standing weekend. at twelve first line out. He won't be in the line out. He'd just be running straight <laughs> out. You know. Yeah. Thing is, I'm not so worried about George. It's his teammates are quite big. He's a big <laughs> lad. <laughs> All people, I'm not worried about George. That's for sure. Um, is Paul Cox so, still in the Wild Knights or? No, he's left. He retired and, and just and, le- and left J- Japanese rugby. Um, they've got uh, Hadley's Hadley Parks is there with him. Oh, he'd um, be running straight after them. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Although I think he probably found it quite funny in the video. Um, oh yeah. We played them two weeks ago as well, which is quite random. And they, it wasn't a close game. They they beat us um, sixty points to twenty. So uh, yeah, fingers crossed. We might surprise them. Um, 
So we'll see. There's a chance. There's a chance. Yeah, it's always a chance. Eh? <laughs> Are you guys full tilt in training, Alex? I mean, it's all running to plan over there. Yeah, there, there is. There is a uh, with the rugby clubs. It's been a bit of a, an issue with with COVID. Um, a couple of teams have had to cancel their games this weekend um, because they've had a, a bit of an outbreak in the in the teams. Uh, touch wood. Um, at the moment, both Panasonic and us uh, have had are okay. Uh, we got mm-hmm. tested um, uh, the back end of last week and uh, seems pretty good at the moment. There's, there's no negative results, so. Hopefully we'll get the first game underway and build from there. Um, but uh, training's is pretty full on. Um, obviously commented previously, and uh, I think at Saracens I hadn't done a, a full contact session for about twelve years. Um, so it's a regular occurrence, fifteen on fifteen, which effectively is twenty nine blokes going hell for leather and me tiptoeing around uh, <laughs> trying not to get hit, Bl- uh, blended in. Yeah, but uh, we had a, a funny one the other day. This winger, uh, Japanese winger. Uh, works for the company he um he split his head and had some stitches uh, and he happens to be um my favorite favorite man Kama, a naked Kama who sits next to me um and uh i'm nodding like i cut. know him but i feel that anybody who's listened to this or watched this probably feels like they know him um yeah foxy if you, if you hadn't heard this guy's just always naked great man but always <laughs> naked even when he puts his suit on it's like shirt tie cuff links you know does his hair yeah. <laughs> still no pants on Anyways, uh, he gets cut, and and I was like, oh, this looks pretty bad. And everyone, like, around the change room is coming round to see what's going on. And, like, 20 people, I'm like, it's only a few stitches, you know. And and they're all, like, smiling and laughing. And I was like, what, what's going on? And it turns out they've got insurance for any stitches they get in their face. They get a payout. So they're all, like, <laughs> jumping for joy and, like, loving life. And, I mean, it's a significant <laughs> amount of money, like... Really, really big, much bigger than I ever imagined. And I remember thinking, God, Brad Barrett would honestly be a millionaire with the amount of st- <laughs> stitches he's had in his head. But I couldn't believe it. They were all like laughing. Like, oh, how many directions you can get in there in his head? And and then two days later, we go out to training, another contact session. Um, I'm like, surely you're not doing contact. And he's like, no, no, hopefully I'll get more stitches. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Couldn't believe what I was, was seeing, but um, have yeah. you taken out that policy now? Then <laughs> no, unfortunately, <laughs> you, you can't get it as a as a foreigner, um, and I think it's a bit different if you're a full professional. But um, yeah, I, I was mesmerised by the amounts of money. It was uh, very large. So yeah, he's a happy man, and uh, fair play to him. Happy. So plenty coming up for you, including what the most bizarre thing is that we've seen on a rugby field. The fact that COVID is playing havoc with the fixture list, as we would have expected. WWE is recruiting from Rugby Union and Rugby League and Scotland seems to be hemorrhaging players at a rate of knots. And to discuss this and more, delighted to say that joining us this evening is the former Scotland captain, John Barkley. John, how are you? I'm well, thank you. How are you, Lee? Very good, thank you. Now, you actually did tell me you were only coming on uh, House of Rugby because it was the only way that you could get Jonathan Davis to speak to you these days. (laughs) That's true. This is the most we've spoken. I can't get him to reply to my messages, so I've got to come on podcast now to try and catch up with old friends. That's the state of my life. It's not you, it's him. (laughs) It's it's, it's definitely me, Um, (laughs) B-Dog. Yeah. I yeah, know it is. Hey, rug- rugby calendar's busy, man. I get it. Oh, yeah. I'm really <laughs> flat out at the moment. Yeah, yeah, I bet. Compared <laughs> to me. <laughs> You're just sitting back having a gin and tonic as a retired player now, John? Is this I actually, I'm here? having a gin and tonic, believe it or not. <laughs> Good guess, Lee. You could hear the ice. That's one of the, one of the perks of not playing rugby anymore. Tell us, uh, Foxy, what were you saying? Uh, John has a nickname the ah, first time that. you met him. I knew this was coming. <laughs> a self-proclaimed nickname. I think... Um, <laughs> 2013, John comes down from Glasgow and um, I think first couple of days in, we're like, oh, any nicknames then? Just trying to break the ice. And he goes, yeah, the boys called me B-Dog up in uh, Glasgow. So we uh, like, B-Dog. Just, you, could, you could have dressed up a bit better than that. All oh, I know literally is, straight I, I, out of the block. <laughs> yeah. Straight out of the block. Yeah, that's how you go down to new club. Or you can choose this, his story or the re- this story. <laughs> I went out for my first night out in Cardiff for the boys. And we had a skin full. Good night. Stayed at Fox and Priestland's flat. They let me kindly stay back in the days when you could go out and stay in people's flats. I thought we all had a nice night. And then I get on a Monday morning and they're telling everyone that I've been on the, on the piss, telling everyone <laughs> that my nickname's B-Dog and that's the only thing they could call me. So that was my entrance on Monday. <laughs> and, then, and then it stuck for, well, it's, it's still here. 
You also stayed, did you not, with uh, John's brother when you were heading back up to Scotland? Like you're basically ingrained in this family. I am, yeah. I uh, I stayed in Cubby's flat uh, for a while. It was luxurious. <laughs> it was like living like I went from living with my wife and three kids to like living like a student. Cubby, <laughs> Cubby didn't have any bed sheets. Or I had a mattress, and he uh, to make it homely, he'd hung he'd hung a towel as a curtain because it was and it didn't cover up the window. That was my that was my home for about two months. I don't know how you did it. I gotta say, like I, I think when my brother moved into the flat with me in Preston, I think that was nearly the end of our relationship. I gotta say, but uh, he'd never open his curtains because I think he read somewhere that Paul Scholes never opened his curtains, and he's like. <laughs> He's a massive Man United fan. He's like, if Scolzi does it, I'm I'm doing it as well. I, so. I thought it was because he didn't have a TV license. <laughs> <laughs> could be that as well. It could be that. Yeah, that was, it was good fun yeah. though. He's still. I, I, we played Scarlets uh, when I still played. And I went to change room afterwards. He comes say hi, and he was wearing my shoes and my pants about three three years <laughs> later. He nicked all my stuff. Yeah, I'd, I'd be in France as well, and I just see on the boys like Instagram and Snapchat that they like were brothers just gone into my wardrobe and just taking clothes and just be a regular occurrence. Yeah. He's some boy. John, uh, I work with you uh, reasonably regularly. We're not going to Finesley, sadly, in a couple of weeks' time. No. However, uh, how is retired life how would you sum that up it's actually something we've talked a lot about on this program getting that transition right and uh doing it in a sort of owning a situation um how has it been for you uh it's been it's been uh probably quite tricky during the first lockdown uh and i kind of flitted between kind of thinking oh i didn't i wasn't that bothered about how the way things ended and like, that's just how it goes uh to being like a bit gutted about it um, mm. I, I, did, I genuinely didn't know which one I thought was true. Uh, I, I just kind of convinced myself that it was all right. And I look back now, and I think I was, you know, I was pretty stressed. I think transitioning is is quite tricky at the best of times. Mm. And you throw in a, you know, a, a global pandemic. Uh, I had a job lined up before lockdown because I knew I was retiring, and then that, like, the job went out the window. Um, so it, it was quite a sort of stressful time, as it has been for a lot of people. But I managed to find a job. Um, and I kind of know I made the right decision because I, when I watch the games now, and I don't know if because there's no crowds and it's not quite the same, I don't think. But I don't, I don't wish I was playing. Um, I feel like, and it's a weird thing, and I've spoke to other guys who retired, like I feel like I never played rugby when I watch a game rugby now. I feel so far removed from the game now, and it's only been, it's not even been a year, that I genuinely I feel like I watch a game and I'm kind of surprised that that's what I used to do. And I think most guys I speak to, and I say similar. It's a really weird uh, feeling to watch it. I watch the game, enjoy watching the game still, but don't miss don't miss training. I didn't train a lot anyway when I was at Scarlets, but, <laughs> but I, Thursday, uh, Friday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, I don't miss it. I, I kind of my I was so I think training became really arduous at the end. Um, like my my Achilles never. By the time I retired, I, I still it took me like an hour to warm up for a session before I went out and it was just it was just everything became a bit laborious so um but yeah that's just part, part of the gig I suppose and uh tv life is, is dead easy isn't it it's dead easy yeah it used to be better I used to get snacks at the games they don't even give you snacks anymore because of COVID <laughs> <laughs> it's good fun I do I do enjoy yeah. the game I was gonna like I thought about coaching and stuff and I did want to say like for me staying involved in the game like I was never like some a lot of some people retire and I, I, I sense like bitterness towards the game and I'm definitely not like that. You know I love the game that gave me you know provided me with all my best memories and you know everything that's happened in my life over the last sixteen years happened alongside rugby. But I did want to stay involved somehow um, and I quite enjoy the TV so it's good fun. We to have fun with some good people and some not so good people but <laughs> mainly good. Um, Name on that note, yeah. um, <laughs> you mentioned COVID and. This is the world in which we live, of course, and it doesn't matter. Alex, as you were saying, it's it's in Japan uh, and, you know, starting to, to stress that league as well, even before it started. And it certainly put pressure on uh, the competition here. The next two rounds of the European Heineken Cup Championship have been, well, hopefully postponed at the moment. But that means finding room in the calendar. Now, I, it was basically all instigated at the weekend 
um, with the French clubs, not sure if they were going to be allowed to travel. EPCR put out a statement. I'm just going to read the the first sentence from it because I think it's it's quite loaded. Um, they just say, following a directive from the French authorities that the participation of top 14 clubs in the Heineken Champions Cup and Challenge Cup at the current mm-hmm. time constitutes too great a public health risk. So we have no choice but to announce on Monday the 11th of January that the tournaments are temporarily suspended. So that's Challenge Cup and Champions Cup. You know, it, it's difficult to see these games postponed, but um, you know, I think the right call was made. Um, but it's, it's, it's a difficult one as, as players because, you know, everything's changing from hour to hour these days. You know, um, you don't know what's going to happen, um, you know, on the weekends coming up, you know, the team might change with, you know, COVID testing and everything like that. So... It's just, it's just adapting to every situation as players and staff we have to do and it's um you know it's a tough one to juggle as um as as you know you can imagine the key to fitting all the rugby in that's still to come this season because there is a lot from um it doesn't matter if it's europe it's six nations it's this lions tour that might or might not go ahead alex when you're um looking in and you see that the premiership haven't moved those fixtures forwards by two weeks. Obviously, there is player welfare, but there hasn't been a massive amount of rugby played for some teams. For others, yes, there has been. But if you're Quinns or a London Irish and you've missed a couple of games, you're desperate to play. Do you think the Premiership should have moved that forward? Look, I think it's, uh, it's obviously difficult looking from the outside in, but um, yeah, I think to get in the line, Premiership has always been a, a big challenge. Uh, all the clubs to agree. And I, I certainly think in this case, it would have been better for them to play in the next two weeks. Um, I think the player welfare card in this regard is, it doesn't really sit too well with me because you're going to have to squeeze these games in somewhere. Um, you know, And therefore, it's going to be a backlog at the back end of the season. So um, look, I personally would have rather they just carried on and played. It's easy for me to say from the outside, but um, unless there's some greater plan that, you're going to go to the knockout stages of Europe straight away or there's some way around mm-hmm. it. Either way, you're going to have to find space somewhere and it means a backlog at the back end of the year, push into the Lions calendar, which is always always and is already a challenge. So um, I think it would be better off just carrying on playing and keep going and put those games forward and then put less pressure on the internationals when they come back from the Six Nations. It's really important that every competition maintains its credibility um, you want to see the best players playing. You need to have leagues completed and you know European Cups completed as best you can. And we're already see, uh, seeing a, a, sh- a shortened version of, of the Champions Cup. And it's just, uh, and like Alex said there, it's like at the other end, you've got the Lions Tour. I think something's got to give. Um, you know, I, I never played for the Lions. Um, I was never good enough. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think... Uh, in my opinion, like for me, I grew up watching the Lions and I always will. And I think, in, in my opinion, for what little it counts, I, I think they need to travel. So if you're going to maintain any kind of credibility across competitions and squeezing games where you can, like push it back or, or push it to another year when you can travel, because like it's almost impossible. Like I think we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, never mind what's going to happen in you know, five, six, seven months. But the, the big issue as well is the the fact that, you know, they talk about player welfare and stuff like that, but are players consulted on their plans when they're making these plans? Do they ask, the, a, a, you know, a senior group of players, like, right, how do you feel about this competition moving in this direction? And is that better for us as a group, do you think? And they just seem to just make a decision and then there you go, boys, off you go and, you know, p- play X amount of games through the year, you know, it's... Um, Have you that, ever been consulted? Thing. Nothing on, like, the Pro 14's been changed, um, the competition to this Rainbow Cup, and I don't think um, our player association was consulted on it. Um, there are the, you know, international players group and stuff, but, you know, change really does happen before, you know, decisions are made before players are probably consulted in, in my eyes. But there's no alignment in, you know, if the Premiership can't agree as, you know, a certain amount of clubs it is, they can't even get to an agreement on what's right. And then, you know, the French League, you know, you've got the Celtic League, you've got, um, you know, Super Rugby, you've got all these different leagues. And obviously we've talked about having World Rugby being aligned. You can't even align your own league. There's no mm-hmm. chance of anything 
progressing in that sense. And if anything's come from this pandemic, it's that we need to come together and try and find solutions for the European Cup or for our own leagues and fit everything in so that the, the most important thing, you know, in my eyes, is the Lions at the end of the season and going on tour. It's the pinnacle for, for Northern Hemisphere. And I think at the moment we're just drifting to everyone's being a bit, not selfish, well, they are being selfish. Everyone wants to get their own uh, league sorted. They want to get this done. They want to get their money. And then, you know, it will just be pushed back further and further. And, um, yeah, the, the fact that there's a lack of alignment will, will only cause more problems. Yeah, there's a lot of a vested interest at the moment, isn't it? I, it was also um, quite strange or maybe just quite French that the uh, the day that the French government uh, forced European rugby to be cancelled is also the day that France announced their Six Nations squad because the Six Nations uh, is just over 20 days away. Um, is that likely to happen? Jonathan, you must uh, be, you know, very much part of the, the Wales thoughts. What, what are you hearing from it? You're going into camp next week, are you? Um, I think the squad's been announced. It was, I think, originally planned next week. But, um, you know, whether there'd be a no games plan now that the coaches might want the boys in early, you know, like like B-Dog said earlier, things change every day. So, like, you know, it's, um, you know, we, we might, the boys might be told at the end of this week, you're in camp next week. And whether we bubble up for the, the whole period, who knows? And it's... Um, yeah, I'm sure things will come to light in the next in the next few days. But it's just, um, yeah, just just wait and see. Just wait by the phone and see what, what's happening. Really, that's what uh, all you're doing these days. B dog, because you're sitting back with your gin and tonic, um, just relaxing. The thought for you now, going into a hotel next week and not emerging until about the 20th of March, would probably <laughs> give you a heart attack. You would retire early if it was going to be, be like that. <laughs> <laughs> get, away from the kids nice for, get away from the kids for a few, a few weeks <laughs> no yeah I feel yeah again like I spoke to some of the boys in camp and it was I didn't really understand the bubbles if I'm honest I still don't like they could leave sometimes and they couldn't but yeah it... we did get to leave but it was like every so often and the emphasis was on like um, your habits outside of the bubble like um, there was a saying like treat the person next to you like they've got COVID so uh there's a lot of side stepping down the street and everything like that, but um, but yeah, no, it 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 was difficult in camp. But like you know, I got to say our entertainments committee were terrible. Like um, names are... Liam Will- Liam Williams, uh, oh. Dylan Lewis, and Corey Hill, they were terrible. The, <laughs> the first quiz night we had was the Thursday of the last the week of the last game. <laughs> um, so it, it was tough. It was tough. Um, <laughs> So um, I think there's going to be more emphasis on that, um, you know, whoever's in that uh, committee you, coming in. But yeah, you can't it, have it's San- like you said. Sanjay on the uh, on the committee. Just if you're playing Call of Duty all day. Well, that's it. That's all he was organising was COD tournaments for the boys. And have you seen have you seen their briefcases they all carry yeah, now with Jesus. their with their yes. COD uh, things? It's ridiculous. Um, <laughs> so yeah, you, you wouldn't see any of the boys. All the boys would be in their rooms playing COD. So that's the world we live in these days. <laughs> Okay, so we touched upon this last week and now we have three players who, for different reasons, have stepped away from a home nation to play their rugby elsewhere at some point. Um, But even before COVID hit, we know that some of the Welsh um, clubs were in trouble. We heard it from Ireland as well. And Scotland at the moment seems to be uh, hemorrhaging players into various leagues and they have been but COVID will only exacerbate that situation. Um, John I'm interested in your thoughts of this I mean you kind of expect in many ways when you've only got two professional sides that maybe your Finn Russells your Johnny Grays your Stuart Hoggs these guys are going to go but the list seems to be increasing particularly this year Um, what do you make of the exodus of players from Edinburgh and Glasgow whether it be to the Prem or over to France? Uh, I think from a, a club point of view as a fan now, like, is it disheartening for fans? Yes. Like, I think there are the noises I hear from certainly Glasgow have, have lost, I think, arguably four or five of their best players in a number of seasons and they've not replaced them, which is the other part of the coin. If they're being replaced, then it's a different story altogether. So from that point of view, it's really hard for people that have got behind these clubs and don't forget Glasgow don't have the history of a 
you know, a Snaffy Scarlets or whoever it might be. That is a relatively new, a, a new club, uh, and they've managed to grow from you know playing at Hewenden and Fir Hill to you know a, a, a pretty positive fan base, and they've grown the club to you know winning the league, uh, competing at the top end of the league, and they're watching their best players leave. So yeah, like it's really hard. You know, you could almost do you could chat about this for a long time. COVID makes it even more complicated. Um, but I, I can I have to look at it as well from a, a player point of view. Like, do I blame the guys for leaving? Absolutely not. I think it's a short career. Um, from a you know ex- experience point of view, you want to go and experience different things. You want to go to different clubs. You want to go and do different things. It's important from a finance point of view. It's important. Um, you know, the players who play maybe can't speak as openly about it. That's part of it. Of course it is. It's a short career. You want to make the most of it. You want to go and play in other countries. Um, so I, I think from, a, you know, I, I moved away um, down to down to Wales and it, I played rugby for 16 years professionally and the five years in Wales were the best years I had from like a rugby point of view and the most fun I had. So I'm always going to back it. I guess in the last point, I've got, I've got a few opinions on this. People think... Uh, like guys that are qualifying. So I know like Duan van der Moer is, is left and he's going to Worcester and people are saying, people are criticizing him and criticizing players that qualify and on the face of it. They're saying you qualify and then you leave that country straight away. And I just, I just think that's absolute nonsense. And the, the club, you know, people feel cheated by that. I just, I think Edinburgh got a fantastic player who was, you know, pro 14 player of the year, you know, topped all the stats for three years. Like, and people say he owes the club more because they got him to Scotland. I, I kind of see part of it, but I also know that the clubs now are so ruthless that if, you know, in a couple of years' time, if, you know, I hope it doesn't happen if someone gets injured or, you know, drops out of form, clubs don't think twice now about getting rid of players. So these stories happen in the background. That is also surely the responsibility of, for example, Scottish rugby, if the, to put in somebody's contract, if you get a debut cap, you must stay in Scotland for a certain amount of time. Well, that, yeah, that's a different... If that's in the contract, then players would come over. I do I do think... like. But you can't blame the player. You can blame no, the course. union or you can blame the club yeah. who didn't ensure that they kept that player. Of course, the, the contracts are there and they're, they're used for... You know, they can be used on, on both sides of the, the contract, can't they? So... Look, Duan probably got a really good offer and he wants to go and do something. He wants to play in different... There's a lot of South Africans down at Worcester. There's a lot of South Africans yeah. at Edinburgh as well, actually. But um, And I'm sure he got a good offer and he's gone. So, you know, I think, you know, to him, you know, what, what's it... Lose? The, the problem is not if they don't replace these players. He'll have freed up a decent-sized chunk in the budget at Edinburgh. So yeah. now, where, what are they going to do with that? Are they going to replace him? And then that gets into the realms of you know head coaches and managers and SOU and the, the budget and COVID and it's, it's never easy. Like I feel sorry for coaches like trying to juggle budgets and finances and no one really knows what to expect. I think the thing you want to see is like I say a player who stays in our squad sees one of the best players leave is that the club has ambition and recruits you know a like for like player you know say right yeah. we're losing. A good player but we're bringing in doesn't have to be the same position but a, a quality player to say right we still want to be competitive not just oh we're happy to for all our best players to leave and um i think it could be quite disheartening for your squad if you don't see you know people coming in of, of the same quality to to fill the gap that's being left for um left by the player that's leaving john made a good point about um the loyalty there and i think yeah, loyalty is spoken about so much in a lot by fans and from the outside. And it's a funny thing because, you know, everyone wants to say, oh, yeah, you know, keep someone at the club for ages and, oh, they're really loyal and stuff. But you're so right. And, and even more so now with COVID and the financial restrictions and difficulties clubs are going through, if you're not doing what they want or performing at the level they expect or suddenly you become a little bit too expensive, they, they'll get rid of you. And that loyalty, they may say, oh, I'm really sorry, we'd love to keep you, but you know, we keep you on half that amount or, well, we have to let you go, you know, it's for the best for your career. You know, it's not, it's, it's not us, it's, you know, it's not you, it's me kind of thing in a relationship, you know, but it's, it's, it's rubbish, you know, like ultimately you are a commodity this day and age. And, and there, are very, there are a few clubs that do that differently and do look after players, but the majority of clubs, it's 
you fulfill a role, you're a commodity. If you're doing that, then great. If you're not, they'll get rid of you. So I think players are, you know, very entitled. If they want to go and earn you know, more money or uh, go somewhere that's slightly more ambitious in their eyes, then then good luck to them in that sense. Um, but I just think it, it's quite easy for people to blame players. Oh, they're not loyal anymore. Mm. You know, it's all different. Well, you know, put the facts in front of uh, any any fan and see what they decide. And they, they're going to decide very similarly to the player. Jonathan, what about your time in France? Because um, obviously Wales has the 60 cap rule now. Um, you went to Clermont um, earlier on in, in, in your career. Um, did you benefit from that experience? Yeah, like playing out in Clermont, I, you know, I, I love my time out there. Um, you know, the support was always amazing. <clears throat> but, um, you know, at the time I probably felt like I wasn't playing my best for Clermont or for Wales because the period of like Six Nations or Autumn where I'd be traveling back and forth um, for fallow weeks to play for Claremont and then back to Wales to play in, in the Six Nations. I was just all over the shop and, you know, I probably didn't give the best account of myself at, um, in my time in Claremont, which was probably frustrating. So when um, I was out of contract, the decision I made purely for to come back was to be the best place to improve my international career. And that was being back in Wales. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if I wasn't an international, I, you know, I may have stayed out in Claremont, but um, for me, you know, playing for my country was the most important thing. And it was like, right, where's the best place for me to be, to, to do that. And I was back in Wales. So at the time in Claremont, loved it, always got fond memories, but you know, it wasn't, help in my international career um, because you were just in two places and you weren't able to, I, I struggled to juggle it personally, probably. Um, yeah. So other people have done well, like you look at, um, you know, um, Finn Russell has done well. He, he loves out in France and he comes back and plays well for Scotland. Um, but other players, you know, probably struggled as well, you know, so it's, it's probably just on a, a you know, a, a single account basis you know, what people think. And from that Welsh perspective of, um, well, it's, I don't know if it's law, but Gatlin's law of the this, is it 60 cap rule? 60 um, caps, yeah. Yeah, 60 caps. How much do you think that has benefited Wales as a nation? It's, it's definitely kept um, players in Wales. It's probably tied a lot of players' hands because um, when, you know, they negotiate contracts, the regions know that yeah. the, the situation with the caps and, you know, are they going to say to the player, right, are you really going to leave Wales and take away your chances of playing for your country? Um, so I'm, you know, I'm sure the region's using in their favour. And so from that perspective, yeah, it probably has helped Wales, but, um, you know, it's um, it's a difficult one because you, you don't want to um, stop a player from, you know, maximising their potential to earn money and, you know, somewhat that 60 cap might do it you know um fortunately when i came when i came in i had 60 odd caps so i didn't really care about it so um <laughs> i was gonna say you folks, your point, your, your point, your point the reason the rule came in you were part of everyone that left you lived in, you were in the golden year when you could just leave and you knew you were yeah. gonna get gas just said make sure you could get full release and he was happy that, that yeah. then he brought in the rule um but no it, it is it is a tough one to you know you can see why the union had done it because um, they don't want to, you know, Welsh rugby doesn't have the biggest player pool and probably financially not as much money as other countries. So they, they've probably tried to you know, damage limitations with it, really. Playing in the down weeks is like, is savage. Oh. Like, and it's really funny when you're, so I played down at Scars for a couple of when I wasn't getting picked. And you're not really aware of it. You know, you, you see the guys coming in, you're thinking, like, why do they not want to come back and play? And then, I, I, I got back into the Scotland team and I it was going to be my first game as captain and uh, Pivai asked me to play in the Fallow week before playing Wales actually so I was playing my first game as Scotland captain and Murrayfield against Wales against all the boys and I had to go down and play Treviso at home in front of like <laughs> do that and my my dad or my brother sent me a message afterwards of the, a clip of the game and the ball was going one way and I'm like running the other way in a game <laughs> like just trying like <laughs> Just you, it's impossible to have the same mindset, and yeah. I applaud anyone that can. Like when there's that much going on in the background, sometimes you come down, it's a big day, you got a big crowd, and, and it takes care of itself. But to come back on, you know, Friday night, um, 
when it's not the biggest game and you've got you've got to try and go out there and play uh it's something you definitely get used to but it's not easy but then you see like you know finn like finn finn does it for rassing all the time he goes and plays and then they asked him to play in a six nations foul a week and he got not concussed and then missed mm. uh Scotland to France as it was the following week. So yeah. yeah. That's what you sign up for when you go away. That's yeah. that's part you, of it. You have you to do. expect it. You 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 get explained that, you know, you understand what you're signing up for. Uh, like I remember, you know, the travel in France was always difficult. Like you'd have like six hour bus journeys and then you'd have to try and get a flight from Clermont to the UK, which would be probably Geneva via Amsterdam or something like that. You know, it'd be absolute carnage. Um so it, it just took it out of you. Then when you're back in camp then you can't just expect to be you know ease back in on a monday you're straight back into it um <laughs> having played a top 14 game and it's um you know it is testing but it, like like b dog said you know what you're signing up for and you know that's probably the reason i chose to to come back was to be in the best place to be looked after and be you know in a good place for test match rugby so, John, what is the answer? Because you mentioned it, um, you know, it happened with Finn Russell. When when you get these big name players who ha- who go elsewhere to, to earn their money and improve their game and then get injured, we've had it with Sean Maitland as well, um, you know, it could happen to, to Stuart Hogg because they have to play. So what does Scottish rugby need to do? Do you need to bring in a rule where you keep your players, your core players, your best players in Scotland or do you have to look at the finances and say, actually, let's get you off our payroll. We'd happily love you to earn a whole load of money if you went and played elsewhere. Yeah, I, I think that with Scotland, you know, Fox touched on it a bit there with four pro teams, the player pool's not big, you know, half that, you know, and below that as well, the, the semi-pro standard in Scotland isn't the same as in Wales no. and the club game's not the same. So actually the players have to leave and the SOU won't want to say that, but they obviously... You know, they obviously agree because they're letting players leave, and but what, maybe they're not agreeing. They don't have the finances to to match to match some of the offers being made. So, mm-hmm. I think players have got to go. I think um, you can, your players will never be able to leave and then ask not to play the week before a test match like that. I just can't imagine that would ever get into a contract unless you're as a like an you know, absolute superstar. But that, it wouldn't it wouldn't go down well. Like, or you want to come to this club, but you don't you want to miss six yeah. or eight weekends for international rugby, you also want to miss the, the eight weekends before that. Like, that's that's just not going to happen. So yeah. I think the onus is on trying to keep keep the players in, you know, that sit below the superstars. I think it's about, you know, smart recruitment, bringing in players that are going to make a difference to the club, you know, recruiting guys that are going to be there in the Fala weeks. You know, Glasgow had that before and guys like, you know, we've not seen Leone Nakarawa this year, but that, you know, arguably someone like that, or, uh, you know, DTH, Van der Merwe, Callan Gibbons, yeah. these guys, they had Petrus, um, who was at Saris, yeah. did the same role at Saris, probably. You know, the guys like that are actually really important, and, but everyone knows that. Everyone's trying, those kind of happen by accident, probably years gone by. And now people realize that actually guys leave and they get injured and they come back and there's big holes in your squad. So because everyone's got their own vested interests. Like they're going to look after their interests, which is, their club, the performances, where they are in the league, because the coaches are judged by that, the club is judged by that, the amount of sponsorship they get is comes off the back of that. So it just it just goes on and on. Like everyone will look, every club will look after their own interests, and if that comes down to playing players, they'll do it. B dog, I feel that we have uh, failed to solve the world's problems over the last twenty minutes or so, but it has been great to have you with us. Just really, so we can take the piss and keep calling you B dog. Um, thank you very much for Foxy to that one. Um, but yeah, thanks very much for your time. I really appreciate it. All right, bye everyone. Have a good show. <laughs> bye. Yeah, always great to hear from John. Now I'm sure everybody at home and you guys as well um, saw the slightly bizarre scene of the sort of um, reincarnation of the Lion King, but sadly it was a red-carded French player (laughs) who lifted up a referee. Um, It was bizarre. I mean, we're all laughing about it. He actually did get sent off for this. Um, It was bizarre though, wasn't it, Jonathan? Yeah, it was, you know, I think what's brilliant about the sport as well, you know, I think... um, don't know why he decided to do it um where, where his rest of his team are going off to celebrate but um i think it was a bit of fun or there was no harm intended whatsoever and um yeah i think i think a red card was maybe an overreaction i think i think ref might have been in shock to be honest 
<laughs> the bit that I liked best was the little dance he did before he lifted the ref. I mean, the intent was there. He'd got into a frenzy. Yeah, he looked excited. I think that was the key. You could sort of sense something was about to bubble over. He was so happy about it. And even when he lifted up, he just had the biggest smile. And you just thought, ah, oh, you know, they've obviously just so chuffed to get the win. Um, I have no idea the context, but in my head, I imagine they've just been hanging on there, defending their line for yeah. 20 minutes and they, they scraped a win. So he was just over the moon. Is, is that one of the more strange, bizarre things that you have seen on a rugby pitch? I mean, have you guys been playing when something's happened or have you seen something that's happened that you've thought, I shouldn't laugh, but I'm going to laugh? Well, I think I, I played in a game uh, for Claremont in a European game and Wayne Barnes was refing and... He got in the way of one of our Georgian flankers and the Georgian flankers just pushed him out of the way. And uh, I think he got a yellow, so he got away lightly there, um, by all accounts. But um, one of the other things, I, I remember playing on Boxing Day um, and as the, the pack go down a, uh, for a scrum, one of the boys who we played with just uh, just screams out, hands up if you had turkey yesterday and everyone just takes up, bursts out in <laughs> tears. Um, but no, that was... That's, you know, picking up the ref, that's definitely up there for me. It's funny you mentioned Wayne Barnes because there's a similar one with Scott Britz where he ran into him and yet uh, Wayne Barnes, Barnes just held his ground and Scott Britz went flying, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> he, 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 he replays that all the time. But um, yeah, the only other one which was quite funny, I think it was J.P. O'Reilly was the... Uh, not J.P. O'Reilly. Um, uh, J.P., the, the ref. Um, he, we were playing sale and uh, John Leota was this uh, big sort of strong centre and pretty physical and um, we all obviously loved a, uh, a good laugh at Chris Ashton's expense who was playing for us and he went to, to sideline at Allianz Park and um, went to pick the ball up and try and take a quick line out or something like that and John Leota he's trying to get the ball off him you know with people like holding on to it and John Leota just pushed him and he just goes straight over the sort of boardings over the other side and there's a Saris fan he just watches him fall over and just with his pint like this just goes looks down doesn't help him just goes <laughs> and carries on and he was supporting his own team and then I think uh, the ref was like thinking oh I better do something and he saw us all laughing and he just went oh he probably deserved it and uh, yeah it, was, it made us laugh a lot that to be fair anything at Chris Ashton's expense yeah, it's always good to have a bit of entertainment in sport. And that takes us nicely on to our next topic because we've been reading about the fact that WWE has, over the last few years, been trying to recruit rugby players from union and league. Um, we'll get into the subject in a few minutes' time. But first, uh, John, Alex, big fans of WWE or did you used to be? Well, I, as a kid, yeah, massively. Um, it was, yeah, I remember buying even the bit videos, like, and fr Friday Night Raw is War. Uh, me and my brother would watch it. Um, so, yeah, uh, back in the day, it was uh, on the weekend TV shed, we'll say the least. Yeah, a, a sort of 90s, uh, me and my brother would always be sort of fighting and, and claiming we were wrestlers, I think. And um, certainly the Royal Rumble was something that we definitely used to video on the VHS and... Uh, <laughs> and watch. I remember watching one where The Rock won, and you know he's he's gone from uh, strength to strength ever since. Really, since then, <laughs> he's, he's, he's not struggling anymore, is he? <laughs> no, he's not he's struggling. Not. Yeah. Uh, well, it's a great time then to bring in Alan Dimmock, uh, a sports journalist, and I'm sure you've already stuff in Rugby World magazine. Um, Alan, you did a really interesting article on this. Just give us a little bit of the background, because people might not necessarily think that these are two sports that go hand in hand. Yeah, well, my interest got peaked because every so often over the last couple of years, stuff stuff tends to do the runs on social media. And we'd see rugby recruitment sites saying, oh, I don't know if you know this, but the uh, World Wrestling Entertainment are trying to get hold of uh, rugby, uh, former rugby athletes or current rugby athletes between the ages of 24 and 28. Do you think you'd be up for it? And we see lots of players sharing that information with each other and having a bit, bit of crack about, oh, yeah, let's get the spandex on and everything. And then it disappears. And every time it comes up, I always think, how genuine is this? So... In the end, I went, why has no one asked WWE about this? So I went directly to them and they said, yep, absolutely, this is 100% legitimate. Do you want to talk to Triple H about it? He's pretty keen to explore the avenue. And 48 hours later, I was on a phone call with them talking about it all and I realised that there was lots of different avenues. And, you know, there's all sorts of stuff about the values of the game and, and what they're after. But realistically, the, 
the kind of athlete that they're looking for is exactly in rugby union's wheelhouse because they're looking for men or women who are of, of uh, mature enough but in their mid to late 20s who have the right physical attributes know how to graft can do a bit of teamwork don't mind touring and that ticks a lot of boxes with rugby and from there on i started talking to a lot of people i, I wasn't quite able to track down uh, any elite stars that wanted to switch over quite yet although wwe have got back to me and said as soon as we find that please come and do a follow-up story mm-hmm. but the I think it's the kind of thing that, that will pique a lot of people's interest, um, if only just because it's a hell of a different lifestyle. And if if we're being realistic, it's not exactly the, no offence, we've got uh, you know European Players of the Year and Lions on the call here, but it's the household name probably isn't, in Rugby Union, probably isn't appealing to little Kevin from Utah. So they've got to build a persona around this and look for something completely completely different. So if you're fancying something different in rugby union, why not throw throw your hand in? Because who knows what sort of lifestyle you'll get at the end of it. Well, I think I can safely say um, you, you, the criteria is cancelled me by age, uh, physical attributes um, and graft probably at that stage. I, I was done for. So um, yeah, I'd watch from the sidelines maybe. Maybe Foxy's got a better chance. I can see you a bit of a Paul Bear, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking Alan looks a bit like, you know, Stone Cold Steve Austin. You know, I was yeah. thinking he's got a bit about him, maybe. <laughs> you know, they did say that we could, yeah, I, I'm free to go around to a trial any day I want, but I might be washing my hair that day, possibly. But it's, <laughs> but it's quite interesting just getting the insight into what goes into the trials that they do. So they, they have, and one of the big things they wanted to, to hit was that when the world goes back to normal, whatever that means, is they're keen to have tryouts with with athletes and those interested in exploring the avenues who meet all the criteria or might take a few of the boxes, but they want to see a bit more from. And they're wanting to hit places like Cape Town, Sydney and London. And obviously those are hotbeds for rugby union. And if you think about somewhere like South Africa, where there's a plethora of rugby talent there, but there's not always the avenues available to them that you think, why wouldn't someone want to to look at that? And what they do at these trials is they, they'll they get them in and do some basic stuff, you know, forward rolls in a ring, um, maybe bounding over each other in a, a big circle, getting into their fight stance, going through some pretty basic techniques. Because realistically, the changeover to becoming a wrestler will only will take years to perfect it, really. But what they want to see is if someone has something, because... You can probably, if you're a, a good athlete, you can probably learn the nuts and bolts in a couple of years to be ring ready. But the hardest part of it and the bit that's probably worth exploring and where rugby union really can learn from wrestling is is the the salesmanship, the the ability to sell something on camera, to embody a character, to try and create something that's marketable really and that's where you have other sports looking at them so we've already seen uh, speaking to triple h he said that formula one is a sport that's been interested in what they have to do and we've seen in the last couple of years on their um netflix show this drive to survive series i don't know if anyone's seen that but one of the big aspects of that is building up the rivalries between them creating a narrative so that it looks like there's animosity between drivers on rivals teams even drivers on their own team between management and whether or not that truly affects the sport it's something that you can sell and rugby has these natural rivalries so it's something that potentially union can learn something from but i i am not uh obviously i do um all the f1 and i've um you know been part of that netflix thing and when you're actually in it and you watch it it's very very good but it's a little manufactured and really that's my point with wwe is that you know i don't know anything about wwe but i've always thought rather than sport like a true competitive sport it was entertainment so how does that go from somebody who is uh, and maybe they just take the money and they have a great life and it's all fine. But if you actually are a competitive, uh, top-level sportsman, entertainment hasn't really been in your circle. You have gone out to win every single time. To, so how do you square that off? Yeah, it's an interesting one, and it's something where we have to almost reverse engineer it. Uh, if you look at other competitive sports like the NBA, um, they sell almost exclusively now sometimes to to young people with the personalities that are involved in the sport the the athletes themselves become the commodity in a lot of places um and whereas you compare that with soccer and the sport itself there's not much 
passion that needs to go round about it because it's such a big powerhouse. But if rugby is to compete in a market where they want as much attention and they're looking for competing with soccer or they're competing with other sports or on cricket and they need that little bit of edge um, globally, they might need to, there might need to be a little element of sport, uh, salesmanship in it. And speaking to Alex Corbusiero for the piece, uh, who's a lifelong wrestling fan, um, one of the things that he said is there are already brilliant narratives in rugby union and you don't need you know you don't need to take away from what the what goes on on the pitch all you need to do is turn the dial up a little bit so if you have something like the east midlands derby where we have a very traditional fixture teams that love knocking into each other if you just did the the marketing around that uh, you don't need to take away from the competitive nature of it because obviously we know that wrestling is very different and whilst you cannot deny the athleticism that's involved, obviously there are storylines, there are writers that are involved. Um, someone sometimes has to play the heel, someone's got to be the hero and as we know, and I'd be interested to get the, the, the guy's views on this, is um, I, I don't. it's a hard sell to say to a rugby player or someone, we're trying to sell this thing uh, do you fancy playing the bad guy for a little bit? I mean, Eddie Jones might not have a problem with doing it. There are certain other coaches that might not have a problem with doing it, but I don't imagine there are too many players that are willing to put their hand up and say, yeah, I'm happy to play the heel for a couple of months. The, the thing that doesn't bode well is that you you go on a field and you, you haven't got, you got 15 other people against you trying to take your head off if you are the heel. But <laughs> there's yeah. no writers telling them to take it easy on you. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, that's the thing. Like, you know, I was going to say, like, right, next press conference I'm in, I'm going to, you know, do the whole The Rock, if you smell what, what The Rock's cooking. But um, it, it's difficult because you don't want to almost want to set yourself up for a fall and yeah. you just do what you have to do and, you know, almost they all say and like you do your talking on the field. Um, mm -hmm. That's probably how I look at it, really. Yeah, I was gonna say it's it is a difficult one. You know, to go into a sort of um, fight battle, whatever it is, sort of knowing that you're you're trying to play the villain and you might have to lose or you might have to do this in a sense or that that be quite hard for us as competitive athletes. Um, although I would say that. You know, growing up as a as a kid, obviously thought it was amazing. It was you know so violent. And as you get older, you go, okay, maybe it's not quite what it seems. You know, it's a bit more acting. Um, I actually met um, uh, John Layfield, JBL, um, <laughs> the legend that he is. And uh, after a few drinks, we were in in on this boat in Bermuda on a, on a Saris trip, and um, just I said, oh, of what course was your it was a Saris yeah. trip. <laughs> well, you yeah, know, it was a pre season trip. It'd been be a, a tough one. <laughs> Um, and uh, we were yeah, back end of the weekend having some fun and we were on, on this boat and uh, it was a pirate ship and uh, I said to JBR I said uh, what's your um, go to move like signature move and it was the, the clothesline from hell I'm sure you, you know Alan and uh, I said oh, do it to me and I go, I go I said, you know it's all acting right I thought let's see what happens so I stood on the edge of this plank and he came in and he hit me so hard. He's about six four, six five. You know, he's a big man, <laughs> and he cleaned me out into the water. And, and ever since, I've I didn't really fancy wrestling after that. To be honest, it, it flipping hurt. So um, yeah, not for me. But uh, I, I think the the sort of you know not hamming it up, but making the rivalry. The rivalry can be there. It's just that I think rugby players perhaps aren't the best when you get into the heat of the battle. Being told what to do would be quite hard for us. You know we just want to go hell for leather and, and give everything. One of the things that the narrative that kept coming up when I was speaking to people in rugby about this and Jamal Ford Robson was really good on this as well, because when he was a teenager, he actually did uh, a bit of, a bit of wrestling. And when he was 19 playing for Cambridge, he, he tried his hand at an amateur event. And there's a, a, if you want to go and look out uh, for a video on his Jamal Ford Robson's YouTube channel, you can see him performing under the ring name crisis with a K and uh, power, power bombing some poor helpless little lad. Um, but he was very interesting talking about um, how the, the problem that you have is we're taught so much that you being part of a team is the most important thing. And you don't want to put your head above the parapet because, you know, if you are seen to be out for it for yourself, then it's, it doesn't really build into the team ethos of rugby union. Whereas perhaps looking ahead it's something that we need to perhaps be a bit more comfortable with when we look at marketing the game of not 
poking people to be to be outlandish in something that they're not, but just supporting guys so that they feel okay to express themselves, whether it's on social media after a game, so it's not the potted answer that they get sent from someone saying, oh, tough loss tonight, thanks thanks for all the support, we'll go out there and do it again. It's, off, it's almost cookie-cutter stuff. But actually <laughs> making young guys feel comfortable so that they can be who they are out in the public, and then when they're out on the field doing their thing, it's someone else in a suit's job to make that rivalry seem something else and build the storyline around it. Now, we're obviously not there at the moment, and who knows what form it can take, and I'm sure it will spin off into something completely different. But as as the years go on and uh, the sporting marketplace gets more competitive, it's something that's potentially worth looking at. So, Jonathan, uh, Alex, who do you think um, that you've either played against, played with over the years that would have been, or maybe still, the perfect WWE candidate? Um, I thought I thought RG Snyman would be pretty good with the sort of big beard, South African guy, massive. Yeah. Um, quite likes playing the villain a bit as well. Thought he, he'd be quite a good one. Um, I thought you'd have to get like a brothers tag tag team one so the Vuna Polas although they both yeah. probably couldn't be bothered um, <laughs> they would be quite funny to see you know Mako signature move of just you know was it um, was it Take- Te- Takeshi or something he used to sit on people and oh, like, yeah. Yeah. Takeshi yeah Takeshi yeah that would be Mako signature move probably um, so that would be quite a good one I think I think Ken Owen would, would be a good bushwhacker oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah no I'd it is interesting, like like you said, the profile of a rugby player, some of the bigger boys could definitely fit in. Gents, that is all we've got time for. Alan, thank you very much for coming on. It's been a real pleasure and a really interesting chat. Um, Boxy and Alex, thank you. Um, what time is it now in, in Japan, Alex? Time to go uh, back to bed? Yeah, back to bed. It's uh, 6.30 a.m. So. Oh, well. Top Probably effort. failing Easy a bit. life. Um, thanks very much to you at home for watching for listening it's been a real pleasure to have you on board have a good week and we will see you next week bye bye you've been watching the house of rugby season three on joe